Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. I want to bring in the man behind the project who give us a reason not to just hope that magazines will cope with ugly covers, but that that next generation will come and build the tools that will solve some of the big problems. So please can we have a warm welcome from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, Evan Upton. I have a free choice. You can sit wherever you I will have this one. So tell us the origin story of this little piece of kit. Okay. Well, I have one of the little... I, I've got to say, I didn't like where your introduction was going there for a little while about uh, the attractiveness of people in your magazine, but... Um, so this is... Uh, uh, this is it. This is this is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we made this in Cambridge in the UK um, to try and get children programming again. We, in the UK, we had a hist we had a, a wonderful period of 10 or 20 years where children had in their bedrooms um, a piece of hardware that they could used to learn to program on. And then maybe they buy it for some different reason. Maybe they buy it in order to play games, or they buy it, their parents would buy it for them to do schoolwork. But all of these machines, they have one thing in common, which is you turn them on, and they go beep. And the first thing you can do is program. And if you want to do something that isn't programming, the first thing you have to do is choose not to program. And what this gave us in the UK, and I think this was common to quite a lot of bits in the developed world, it gave us one or two generations where everyone who had a, any aptitude for programming had a chance to discover that they had that. Um, and then that went away. So this was the BBC Micro, was and there was a, an education project and relatively affordable hardware. Yeah, so, so for me this was the BBC Micro, for a lot of other people this was a ZX Spectrum or a Commodore 64, or in the US a TRS-80. All of these, these machines had a lot in common. Um, and uh, we, so at the University of Cambridge, we got really fat and happy. You know, we could just rely on 18-year-olds coming in the door, and all of these guys were, um, but then you had a program. They'd, they'd been programming for 10 years. And we had to teach them they didn't know everything. So sort of fast forward a decade or two, and you're teaching computer science, you're running a department, you're choosing the undergraduates, and you find that the quality in programming and also in maths isn't there. Yeah, absolutely. So we go from having, in the 1990s, we go from having 500 applicants for our 70 or 80 places. That's a pretty typical Cambridge application ratio. We go down to 250. And at the same time we go from 500 applicants to 250, the sorts of things those people know how to do go from very, very deep, technically skilled graphics hacking, frequently a lot of people writing computer games, down to a world in which a lot of our applicants have only ever designed a web page. So why did you think that you know, we as a group of academics can create a product? Um, most of us who have been involved in Raspberry Pi have done some business before, so, so there's, there is a reason why there are six of us, and we've got a mixture of academics and, and business people who came through. Um, and it was just a feeling that, uh, you know, this is a very, this is a comparatively simple product. You, know, you look at it and, and you, can see on the, you can see on the cover, you know, there's, there's just not that much, there's not that much to it. Uh, and so it felt like something which was achievable, and it felt like some, something which was going to, felt like we could build something we could put in children's, we could get into children's lives, like our machines do in the end. They could get into children's lives for another reason, because they're fun to play games on, or they're fun to play videos on. But they still, they'd have that hook. They'd have that hook to get into a child's life, and then all of those programming capabilities, which are really lacking from the best machine. So we can talk in a minute about what it does, but the extraordinary thing is how many people got excited about it and bought it. So when did it launch? So it launched on the 29th of February 2012. And when did you sell your millionth unit? Sometime in February, sometime in February this year. So, yeah. in less than a year, a brand new product without a vast marketing yeah. budget. Yeah. So, with no marketing budget. So this has been done with zero marketing budget. Today. And not necessarily the most catchy of names. <laughs> No, I hated the name so badly for, for the first few years. It was just, uh, and we had this lovely idea, and then we stuck this silly name on it. Uh, and I just, just, uh, I, was, I was just cursing it. And so, where did the name come from? Raspberry is, is fruit named computer companies. So there's a lot of fruit named computer companies, and there aren't that many fruit left. Uh, <laughs> so we really are down to kind of brass tax gooseberries and raspberries and, you know, uh, and, 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 the, and the pie. Uh, and the pie was Python. There's a program language called Python. Uh, which is, and I can spell, so uh, there's a programming language called Python, and we love Python, it's got a lot of that immediacy that, that BASIC used to have, the language that most of us learned on. Uh, the hello world in Python is just print hello world. 
Uh, so it's nice and simple, and it, but it will take you from that starting point all the way up to a lot of Google software is written in Python. So you have one language which, which spans the gamut from that first computer program all the way up to professional software engineering. But when we thought, so Pi, you're going to make a machine that can run Python, Pi, and we thought that Pi symbol would make a lovely, a lovely logo, which, and then of course we've never used that. Doesn't it run Linux? It does, so it runs Python on Linux. Okay. You need a branding consistent. We do. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think now's the time. Yeah. Throw away Raspberry Pi and call it. Yeah. But tell us what it does, because it doesn't look like a computer most people will be familiar yeah. with. So, the idea was there's no point in making a there's no point in making a twenty five dollar computer if you need a hundred dollars of stuff to make it work. So all of the things that you that you need in order to make this thing work are supposed to be things you can scrounge up that you can scavenge from somewhere. So we plug it into a really most of the area of board is connectors. So we've got a plug for a HDMI television. Because everybody's got a TV. Everyone's got a TV. Maybe not an HDMI television, but maybe an old television. So we've got a plug for a composite television. And the value of a composite television in the UK is negative, right? Because you have to pay somebody to take it away. So you, know, you go find your, find your grandma and say, yeah, grandma, you've got an old composite telly in the attic. And run it around and say so you get your display. USB mouse and keyboard. I mean, that's, that's a specialist item, but USB, I and mean, there are a lot of mouse and keyboards kicking around. A lot of offices just throwing up mice and keyboards out the door. So USB mouse and keyboard. Um, Ethernet to connect to the, to the internet. SD card on the back, so this thing is an SD card socket. So a lot of people have got old digital cameras that came with a lousy, low capacity SD card, you slap that in there. And then a mobile phone charger for a power supply. The whole thing is low enough power that it can reach, because it's using mobile phone technology, it can reach its power out of the mobile phone power. How big is the processor? So it's a 700 megahertz processor, which by the standards of a modern cell phone is kind of fairly, fairly modest. You know, this is something like a PC from the early part of the last decade. Uh, but it's still a 700 megahertz processor. My BBC had a 2 megahertz processor. My Commodore Amiga, which was my prized possession when I was a 16 year old, had a 7 megahertz processor. So this is, it's, it's on a different level. What do I do with it? I plug it into my TV, I get a keyboard and a mouse, but then what do I do with it? So you can just use it like a PC. That's the idea. Is it boots, it gives you a window system and a web browser and a video player, and all of those <coughs> things that you're used to. It gives you a bit, it's Linux, not Windows. So that can be a little bit of a, a disconnect for some people. And the process is a little slow, so when you drag Windows around, sometimes it's a little less kind of smooth and shiny than it would be on a Mac. Um, but really it's a PC. But Along with all of those tools that you're used to, you know, web processors and web browsers, it's also bundled with every programming language we can think of. So we bundle every programming language into our web systems. And what are people using it for? Well, I'm a software engineer, I'm a software engineer by, by background. I'm not really anything by training, but I'm mostly a software engineer. So when we designed this, I thought people will do software with it. This will be, they'll do the things I did when I was a kid. So they'll, they'll be graphics things. And it, of course, it turns out actually that moving, like moving a pixel, moving a block around on the screen is a lot less sexy than it was in the 1980s. <laughs> and so, for, for what is still exactly as sexy, or maybe more sexy than it was in the 1980s, is, is doing stuff in the real world, doing stuff in the physical world. And we have this connector up here along this edge, which we call general purpose IO, general purpose input output. And this allows you to connect this. And this is something you genuinely, in a lot of ways, this is like a slow, cheap PC. But this is genuinely something you can't do with a typical PC, which is to go out and actually control things in the physical environment. So we have people doing all sorts of things. There's a guy built a, um, uh, a, um, an application so he could open his garage door using Siri. He was Siri open the garage door, and it would go away and open his garage door, and that was driven by a pie. We have people putting them in high altitude balloons. There's a chap just down the road in Buckinghamshire who puts these under weather balloons and sends them up to 40 kilometers and takes pictures of the Earth in the edge of space. And he does that pretty much every weekend. Um, so there's a lot of these, these kind of more physical activities that we did our agency kind of. I was at the MIT Media Lab um, a few weeks ago in the department where they make prosthetic limbs, and one of these babies was powering a knee. Yeah, I've, so, I've, so I've seen this, and we need to get this. We need to get this one on the website. And it's what's really interesting is we've been we've been here for 15 months. We've been in the market for 15 months, and people have just started to see it as being a piece of labor, a thing that they can just assume is there. But if you if you want to drive a prosthetic knee or a balloon or a garage door, this is a bit of Lego that lets you connect the internet to the real world. And people are going online and sharing their Raspberry Pi projects. Absolutely. It's becoming a social sharing. Yeah, and that was the real surprise that you have this maker community that's been a big, I guess, a big development over the last 10 years, the rise of this maker hacker demographic. Um, and it, it looks like they've been, they've been working for us. So you've created this phenomenon that's on sale for not very much money. How do you manufacture it at such a low price? 
a lot of effort went into, again, comes back to the simplicity, a lot of effort went into whittling every last component out of this board. Um, the, so there are about 180 components on that board compared to maybe a few thousand in a typical cell phone. Um, we're very lucky we have a chip um, from, uh, we, we have a chip that integrates almost all of the functionality of this thing, so that black square in the middle, the black square in the middle of the board has almost all the functionality here, so that helped. Um, and then we, we did what everyone else did, which is we, when you want to make cheap electronics, we went to China. Um, we were very lucky, we, we had somebody out there, we had a friend out there who helped us find a, find a factory, and we started building these things in China. Um, and so for the first six months, they were being built in China. But then the really interesting thing was that we found we could build them in the UK for the same price as in China. And so these are now built for us in South Wales, about 10 miles from where I was born, by Sony. And who knew that Sony did contract manufacturing with other people's products? So it's built for us by Sony in the factory where they used to build all of the traditional intelligence in the whole of Europe. It's an enormous warehouse, an aircraft hangar of a place. And there are businesses that are teaching you how to use it and giving you a a full packet with some instructions. Yeah. So the case is a really interesting example. We didn't build a case for this because we didn't think we were going to sell enough of them to, to, for the injection mold to be worth it. Injection molds cost ten thousand, ten thousand pounds, ten thousand dollars to make an injection mold. We thought we were only going to sell a thousand of them, so we so we didn't cut the injection mold. What we've accidentally done by doing that is to create this whole ecosystem. And the case that's on the front cover of the magazine is a really good example of this. That's made in um, that's made in Sheffield. Um, there's, there's somebody we know up there. In fact, the guy who designed our, our novel eye symbol containing logo for us is up in Sheffield. He's got an enormous workshop now. He's gone, gone in nine months from nothing to this enormous workshop of laser cutters churning laser in there. Now, a lot of people here would love it if their business launched a product which sold a million in a few months. I mean, what lessons have you learned about what made this such a hit? Um, it's one of those things where you generalise, you try and generalise and, uh, and you don't always, don't always get the right generalisation. I guess we've done three things that I think I'm proud of. I think we've, we've got good technology, it's, it genuinely is a good product, we're not trying to sell people a, either a bad product or a generic product that's the same as something that else is out there, and that's really helped them. Um, and that's not obviously replicable because it's, it's, not, it's not the case that you can just say, I'm going to create a new category defining product, which doesn't happen. Um, We've had very good marketing. Although we've had no market, smart marketing spend, um, my wife has been working for us since uh, two years ago. We had this accidental announcement two years ago. And my wife has been working for well, a picture of her in the magazine as well. Um, and she would have been on the cover, but yeah, yeah, she box one. Cover girl, you know, so, <laughs> I, had to, I had a lot of explaining to do. Um, <laughs> it's a really lovely, at least you put it first in the magazine, so before I do the rest of it. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, she's been working for us for two years, and so we paid a lot of attention to social media, paid a lot of attention to community, paid a lot of attention to listening to what people want. This one is actually the deluxe model. This is the thirty-five dollar one. Um, this is the, which has got network and two USB sockets, where the twenty-five dollar one, which is was the signature product, only has one USB and no network. And so by the reason we and we launched this one first. So the reason we ended up launching this first was the community. Most of those people in the community were telling us, "Well, it's all very well you're going to build a twenty-five dollar computer, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have to spend twenty dollars putting a USB hub and a network controller on it, so we can talk to a network and talk to a massive people at the same time." So by talking to the community, we found actually, well, they were going to get twenty-five dollars and they were going to spend twenty dollars, but actually we can offer that functionality much more cheaply. And that's how we ended up with our twenty-five dollar computer costing thirty-five dollars for the first six months. Um, so that, and then the last one, I guess, was business model. That we're a charity, not for profit. Uh, all of the money that we, all our startup money, we had a quarter of a million dollars of, of loan capital to get out of the door, and that was all three of us just threw our money in a hat, pretty much. Um, the thing that's allowed us to ship a million units on. $250,000 of startup capital is that we stopped trying to be a manufacturing company and we became like a licensing company. So we designed this, we, we own the design, we develop the design, we own the brand and we develop the brand. But we license those two pieces of intellectual property to manufacturing partners and they do the work. They, they provide the capital, they provide the logistics and the supply chain management. And so we're working with two billion dollar UK listed companies that are our partners and they do that heavy lifting. They do what they're good at. Logistics and supply chain, and we do what we do that. This licensing model has been very successful for another Cambridge startup. Indeed, hasn't it? absolutely. Well yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to pretend that we've, we've, we've invented that. But yeah, it's really it's taking a leaf out of arms. But yeah. so I think really the, the goal for us is to try to take those app makers who are predominantly adults, they're predominantly adults in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and get them to engage, get them to get them to engage with children, get them to be you know approachable.
uh, use them as a resource. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of willingness that I mean, people like to share their details because people like the idea that there'll be another generation after them who find the same sorts of things interesting. So when are we going to know whether your original ambitions have been met when you've got a generation of undergraduates who can actually code and make things? Yeah. So I think we're going to know in 10 years. And that's all, that was the problem at the start. The problem at the start was we stopped filling up this pipeline. And, and a lot of you think you're filling this pipeline with eight-year-old children. And if you stop filling the pipeline, you've got 10 years where the pipeline empties out and everything's fine. And you wake up one day and you've got no engineers and you're 10 years away from being able to make any more. Um, so I think, you know, let's, say, let's be optimistic in 2020. If we, if we are seeing an uptick, we did see an uptick at Cambridge this year, but I'm not sure we can claim credit for it. Mm -hmm. if, we see, if we see good numbers in 2020, then maybe we'll, we'll take the 10th of the credit. I've been at the DNA Summit here in London and happened to meet one of the guys who's responsible for this thing. There the, we are. Focus on, focus on the star. There. Well, there we go. The Raspberry Pi. Evan, that was quite a presentation, I have to say. Oh, it's, it's a good story, isn't it? It's I mean, an amazing story. I had no idea. It's this really, it's this, it's this weird world in which you know we've got a 15. I was just saying to uh, we've gone 15 months from. I had a spreadsheet. I used to, it probably still exists. It's a Google Doc that told me where every Raspberry Pi in the world is. <laughs> um, and they were that precious that they got signed in and out and they all the data went into the spreadsheet. So, you know, we've gone from that to being, to, you know, to being able to come to events like this and go, ooh, a million units. Yeah. So if you could say anything to the greater community out there, specifically yeah. those watching on YouTube, what would you say to them? Uh, I would say that, um, I think I mentioned it in my talk, that, you know, I'm a software engineer, so whenever I think about engineering, I think about software. Um, a lot of the cool stuff people have been doing with the Raspberry Pi is kind of reminded me that there's more. There's more to engineering than just than just software. There's more to engineering than just going and getting a job at Facebook. You know, we've got all this stuff here. You know, we're 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 in this we're in this room full of engineering and, and full of real real engineering, which is the sort of stuff that you know we like to think we're good at here in the UK. Uh, we like to think we're good at in the developed world. So yeah, be a, be engineers. That's the message. But don't just be a software engineer. Be a be a race car engineer or be a hardware engineer. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. And remember, yeah, girls, that's the, the, the easiest way for us to get 2x the number of engineers. Girls.